It is good to see everyone here tonight, and I, uh, I think uh, on this special occasion, I think we have spent uh, uh, the last hour uh, talking to Seth and uh, talking to uh, one another about Seth's calling, and so I appreciate you guys all being here to support Seth and, and this decision and this wonderful step in, in his life. And so um, we, are, we are honored and we are privileged to not only be here together to, to celebrate this, this event, but also to have Brother Joe and, and, and uh, Brother Tommy. Uh, if you want to sit down here with Brother Joe, we're going to need you again here in just a second. Um, but, uh, but also Brother John Whitaker, uh, Brother Seth's pastor from Kentucky. Uh, and you have to tell me the town again. Clarkston. Clarkston. He, he told me that this morning. You told me that, didn't you? <laughs> I forgot. Um, but anyway, it is, it is good that you are here tonight to celebrate this. Here in just a moment, we're going to... Uh, to confirm uh, Brother Seth's uh, calling and uh, in, in ordaining him, and uh, so, but first we're gonna we're gonna celebrate and worship in a little bit of song. Uh, I'd like to lead us off in a word of prayer. So, if you'll all bow your heads with me, please, and we'll go to the Lord first in a word of prayer. Lord, tonight as we come into the sanctuary, Father, we thank you uh, above all for for the wonderful love that you have for each and every one of us. Father, we thank you for for your mercy and your grace that's evident in our lives. Father, we. We also thank you for taking that extra step with each one of us, and, uh, and, and Lord, and just using us uh, for the furtherance of your kingdom. Uh, Lord, tonight as we set aside a special service just for uh, an ordination of, of one of your children, of one of your servants, Father, we thank you for the calling that you have placed in his life. Father, we thank you for the, the meaningfulness that, that we can be humbled by this calling. Uh, and Lord, for that we can just be part of it and celebrate with him. Uh, in this in this celebration, uh, so Father, tonight as we as we set aside this portion of, of worship, Father, may you be glorified by it. May you be glorified in it, uh, and Lord, may we be able to to benefit and to grow closer together as a church uh, through it. Uh, and Lord, we'll be careful to ask all of this in Jesus' precious and holy name. And amen. Amen. But then. Let's begin our <clears throat> service this evening by taking a hymn. Let's turn to hymn number. 15, come thy fount of every blessing.
So here in just a moment, we're going to have Brother John, who's going to come and, and preach the charge, but it's my responsibility um, as the moderator for the uh, ordination committee just a few minutes ago to, uh, to speak to the, the, uh, the conversation that we had with Seth. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, uh, verse 22, it says, Lay hands suddenly on no man. All right, and that's speaking to, if you will, this, this ordination or this confirming of a calling. Now, the beauty of that is that Seth is not new to this congregation. The beauty of that is that not only did the folks on the ordination committee, but also the church at large has been, uh, been able to see you grow up and to see not just where you are now, but to see how you got there, right? Amen. And so the, the beauty of that in the ordination council was able to, to glean a lot from that was that we already have a lot of this um, confirmation in front of us as, uh, already. Uh, it is my great pleasure to, uh, to express the results that we are absolutely uh, confirming Seth as a candidate for ordination uh, and moving forward in not only just uh, that process with him but in support of that calling in his life. It's exciting. Amen? Amen. Amen. It's, it's a beautiful thing, and as I said in the committee, a very fearful thing to be called by God to do the service that He has called us to do. Um, it's beautiful because it's divine. It's eternal. It, it, it's, it's not something that, that we as men or women confirm, but that God confirmed in His heart. Right. All right? But it's also one of those things that's very fearful because it's a huge measure of responsibility. Um, there's, a, there's a weight of responsibility that, that goes far beyond a church or a, a group of believers. It's a very divine thing. God himself is who we answer to as ordained uh, ministers. So uh, as an ordination committee, as we, as we got together and we disbanded, um, we do recommend Seth for ordination. Um, and it is our great pleasure to do so uh, here tonight. Um, Brother John Whitaker um, is Seth's pastor in Kentucky. Uh, and I'm going to ask Brother John to come now to preach the charge uh, to not only the church, but to Brother Seth uh, as we move forward with the ordination. Brother John? I'll tell you a little bit. Uh, one of my hobbies, I love to fish, and I'm 44 years old, and, and this past, just a couple weeks ago, I started hunting for the first time. And uh, this is a this is a shell that goes in the gun that I was using. And my uncle, we went for a visit in uh, Huntsville, Alabama, and he pulled me aside and he said, "I'd like to give you something." And I, of course, I didn't have any idea what he was talking about. I even had had even seen my uncle for uh, in their home for several years. Well, he went up into his bedroom, pulled out this gun case, and I was like, "Uh oh, what's this?" And he opened up he opened up this uh, case, and inside was a was a Remington 270. And I thought. You know, my jaw's on the floor, and he said, my sons aren't going to use this. They don't want it. I don't hunt anymore. Will you take it? And I was like, uh, wow. yeah. And uh, even if I just go out and target shoot, sure. He said, well, I want you to send me a picture of the first harvest that you get. And uh, so on the way down here, I did go. Uh, not on the way down here, I didn't go. But um, I did go hunting, and I, I got an eight-point buck first time, Brother Joe. So... And I got a doe that night, so I'm done in one day. And this is a long year, I'm telling you. i got to wait a whole year to do this again. But uh, on the way down here, I counted 41 turkeys and 27 deer. And uh, I saw three hawks going down and catching their prey. And, and so what I want to lead into here is that, Seth, when God puts a call on your, on your heart and on your mind, you look at the world differently. Amen. I have a new hobby, and I look at the world differently. I probably spent more time doing this looking at tree lines and, and yeah. things going down here and looking for deer and how the world's moving in a way that I didn't understand now. You've been in ministry for a long time, but God has set you aside now in, in a different way. And uh, as we talked in the, in the council, it was God that did this in you long before the ordination council approved of you. And this Amen. church has approved of you many years before this, this night. And we, we wholeheartedly look forward to hearing about how God's going to use you in the future. Amen. Seth is uh, ministering to our youth, and they're different. I told him that uh, they're great. They're, they're wonderful kids, but 
the advantage that I had growing up was that I had parents that loved Jesus and taught Jesus in our home. Many of the teenagers that come to our church do not have that advantage. In fact, many of you spend time in the work world and, and other places with, with people that do not orient their life around Christ anymore. And so the, the challenge as we leave here tonight, I'm, I'm preaching all to all of us, but the challenge not just for Seth, but for all of us, is to hold Christ high in your heart and in your mind and realize that no matter what happens in the world around you, He has set you apart. You are a disciple of Christ Jesus, and you have a role much like Seth. You are a herald of the gospel. And so three quick points tonight will be the basis of your ministry, the basics of your ministry, and then the bolstering of your ministry. The basics I can cover in one verse. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, it says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by His appearing and by His kingdom. That's the basis. It's Christ Jesus. It's by, in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who is your judge. No matter what happens, I am your pastor. We will have conversations. Some, sometimes they may, be, they may be confusing. Sometimes they may be challenging. Sometimes you might disagree with me, and that's okay. Because it is Christ Jesus who is the judge and the basis of your ministry. Now the basics of your ministry, this, y'all are thinking this is going to be a quick sermon. This is where we get into the meat of it, okay? The basis of it is Christ Jesus and God who has called you. The, basis, the basics of it start with verse 2. Preach the word. And you're thinking already, I'm not a preacher, Brother John. Oh, yes, you are. If God has set you aside for ministry, you have a calling to be a herald of the gospel. Now, your role is not to be in the pulpit every week, although I will continue to ask you, and I hope you agree to that sometime. Your role is to preach, and he does a fine job preaching to our youth on Wednesday nights and uh, Sunday nights, and, and he will continue to, to do that. Verse 2 says, preach the word. Here's the hard part for us. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and understanding. Another version says great patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, be sober-minded always, enduring suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Would you pray with me? Father, we love you and we thank you for this setting aside this evening where we, we come together to celebrate that you are still raising up men into ministry. I thank you for Seth and I thank you for Heather because the calling, though it is primarily for Seth, it is also for Heather. And I pray that you empower both of them, that you show them with great patience and love how you want, to, how you want them to become more like Christ, that you bond them in their marriage, that you that you uh, continue to lead them as new parents and as the mentors for young people in our area. Father, we love you, and I ask that you would be here with us in this service. You've already anointed us with your presence, and I thank you for that. Speak through me, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The basics of ministry start, again, with preach the word. And it says, be ready in season and out of season. I was a youth minister for most of my career. I spent 14 years in the trenches doing what what Seth is doing, and, and I enjoyed it, but I knew eventually that there was a calling on my heart and mind that God was going to open that door to preach uh, full time. And so when I was a youth minister, I tried to take every advantage of, of times to do that in nursing homes and children's ministry events. And uh, one time I was actually performing duties at First Baptist Church of Martin, where we lived for seven years, so don't just count me off because, or write me off because I'm from Kentucky. We, we spent a lot of time here. I call it our great mission trip to Tennessee. But um, we, <laughs> we have, I was doing our performing duties at First Baptist Martin, and I got a call from another pastor across town. And uh, he said, we need to take an emergency trip to, to Memphis, to the Med, to take our, our son down there. Can you come and preach for me? And I'm looking at my clock and said, what time's your service? And, and uh, he, said it, he said it starts at 1030, and it was 10 o'clock. And I thought, oh, no. Normally I would jump at the chance to go and preach, but he said, he said, I don't know who else I can call. I said, give me a second or two. And that verse went through my mind, in season and out of season. I'm thinking, I don't know, this isn't even a season. This is just nuts. And uh, 
I thought, okay, I need to call my pastor. I called and asked permission, and, and another 15 minutes later, I was out at Pleasant Hill Baptist Church and uh, was able to preach the word. And when there's a when there's a, a love in your heart for what God has called you to do, and you understand the good news, you'll take every opportunity. And, and Seth is that type of man in Clarkson. The reason nobody nobody knows where Clarkson is, Ben, is because if you ever head to Louisville or Lexington or anything uh, east of there, the pit stop on the Western Kentucky Parkway is Litchfield. You know that. You've been that way. You have filled up, you've emptied and filled up again, and you're, you're moving right along, and the next exit is Clarkson. Nobody knows it's there because nobody, there's, everybody fills up at Litchfield. So that, that's where we live. We live in that place that everybody blinks and misses, but there's a great little cafe there and a great little church just around the corner from that exit. So if you're ever in the area, stop. He says, preach the word. Be ready. He also says to reprove, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. And this is this is the hard part for us because uh, it's been said in ministry that Seth, you must have the hide of a rhinoceros, the mind of a scholar, and the heart of a child. Now, at different points, I've had all three of those. Uh, the challenge is to have them all at once <laughs> because it's hard doing what we do. Amen. You've got to preach. And, and sometimes your preaching will look a little bit different because you've got to reprove, exhort, and encourage. Your preaching doesn't have to be 40 minutes long. Sometimes it's going to take place across a chair looking at a teenager. You're going to encourage them and exhort them in ways that they, they need. Don't apologize for preaching because that is your role. It's your calling. Amen. It's not just your job. This right. is what God has called you to do. And, and so as you, as you teach and interact with the teens... They need the Word of God to transform them. And that's what I've told you from the day you arrived in Clarkson. The Word of God transforms them. It's not pizza. It's not games. It's, and he has some great games. It is, it is not your personality. And I've tried to do all of those things to transform kids. And I finally realized that what's transforming in a heart and a mind of a person is the Word of God. Amen. 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 The, the Spirit moving in you and sharpening you and making you different than you used to be. Everybody just take a moment and think back to how you used to be before Christ. Thank God we've grown, right? Thank God for grace and truth. And so we cannot apologize for preaching. We cannot uh, apologize for correcting. Paul encouraged ministers to correct those. And part of the exhortation that your pastor, Prince William, brings every time he comes to the pulpit is... What? <laughs> is to correct his royalty. I mean, I'm, I've been blessed this week. Okay, I've met a famous author. I've met royalty. I'm here on God's business. I mean, this has been a good weekend. Okay? Ben comes here to correct many times because there's things that, honestly, we're fallible people, all of us, including him, and we know that that we are easily distracted by sin and the hindrances that, that weigh us down from time to time. There's a law term for this, and it's called cross-examination. Mm -hmm. And we've got to cross-examine the heart. Your task is to cross-examine, to look closely at the culture, and then bring sometimes a correction to the teenagers and to the, the adults that you teach because... If we're walking one way like the people of Israel did, Moses had to correct them. Joshua had to correct them. The judges had to correct them and bring them back, and that is your role. God's Word never changes, but this culture does, doesn't it? That's right. Mm -hmm. This culture has changed vastly since I started ministry close to 20 years ago, and it will continue to change, but God's Word never changes. That's right. God willing, this church will be here for another few centuries, and, and, if, and if it is, it will be because of God's Word. Not because the pastor that fills the pulpit, not because the men that you ordain, not because of anything that you have done as a church. It will be because of God's word and your stance to stand on that word and his truth. We must correct the culture. It also says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 to rebuke. This is a little bit harder because Paul encouraged ministers to rebuke in the early church. This world, uh, in the early church, in the world that we live in today, involved moral error. And sometimes some of the things that are going on now are just not right. You shake your head. Hey, any of y'all ever go to Walmart to make yourself feel better about yourself? You just, kind of, you just kind of walk around shaking your head going, that ain't right. That ain't not right. That ain't right. And that's even worse. There's, there's, there's sometimes where you look at the world and you just go, oh, what is it coming to? And, and there's, because you know the Word of God, 
you know that there's a difference in the way that you live your life. And sometimes when you get the opportunity to rebuke someone, here's the hard part. Seth and I have talked about this before. Because in, in 1 Peter chapter 3 it says, Always have an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. And sometimes that involves rebuking. But it says, mm -hmm. do this. Does anybody know the next two words? With gentleness and respect gentleness and respect. And frankly, that is why the church has gotten such a bad name. Because we oftentimes lambast this culture with the Bible, but we don't do it with gentleness and respect. And Seth is, Seth is a gentle soul, and he, he guides the, uh, the youth and the teenagers and the adults at our church so well. And, and honestly, his, his little daughters over here, all of you that have children know that you become a better person when you have children. And he is, he is, his heart has softened even more. And he looks at the world differently because of his daughter. The Word of God also says encourage. With great patience, careful instruction. Paul encouraged ministers to exhort and to encourage. Two ideas here are to urge forward and to take responsibility. It's your responsibility said to encourage. To encourage the church, not just not just the youth uh, at the church. There may be a time when God closes this door and He calls you to preach. And I know that's scary and Heather's probably praying against it. But there's just, there's just, you just don't know what the Lord's going to do. That's right. He might call you, who knows what He might do in your life. And at all times, you are a pastor. You are a pastor of our church and have been a pastor of churches in West Kentucky or West Tennessee as well. You are to encourage this culture to examine the claims of Jesus and urge people to make decisions in accordance with His will. And, and that, that charge comes to you as well. The decisions that you make about your future first are, are balanced and bounced off of Christ Jesus' will, not your own. Amen. And, and that is, that's, that's hard to do. It means, this means to reinforce what you already know and do. Later on in that passage it says, Be prepared for a time when people will not listen. I think we may be there. When people will go to a place where they want their ears tickled. And I can, I can name off a handful of ministers right now that have coliseums full of people hearing what they want to hear. When I come to church and I've sat in the pew longer than I've preached, there was a time when I, was, I needed to have my heart stabbed with the Holy Word of God. Amen. It cuts both ways. It encourages and strengthens and encourages, exhorts and rebukes. There were times when I knew I was in the wrong, when I was walking the prodigal way. And when I came to church, I needed to hear God say no. I was looking for boundaries at times. And so, so do we all over the years. Be prepared for that. When you preach, when you share the message of God, there's times, and it's already happened, when people just don't want to hear it. That doesn't mean you're wrong. It just means their heart is not in the state prepared. And you go back and you pray for them. Because it's really hard. It's really hard to be bitter and hard-hearted towards someone that you're praying for. Right. I found that out over the years. Later on in verse 5 it says, Be sober in all things. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. It doesn't mean be an evangelist. It doesn't mean that you have to go out and try to fill coliseums and preach like Billy Graham. It says do the work of an evangelist. Be prepared to share that message, that good news message with everyone that you meet. I don't know if you know this or not, but Seth works at Twin Lakes Hospital in Litchfield. And his reputation of work there preceded him before he started interviewing in our church. And uh, people would, were talking about him and how good of a man he was and how much he interacted as a Christian in a very public place. He's already uh, shared with me that there's been some repercussions from that. People just turn off their ears. They walk out of the room. They don't want to hear what he has to say sometimes. And But that again is not your fault. You're doing what God has called you to do. Amen. You're doing what Christians ought to do. And if we close ourselves off and, and agree with the world that there is no public, there's no place for the public Jesus anymore, our churches will close our doors. The gospel will drift into, into irrelevance. It is Christians with backbone that make the, the uh, gospel go forward. Everywhere you go, if you do these things, Seth, you'll be remembered first and foremost for being a man after God's own heart. Amen. That is my prayer for you. Third, 
It's the bolstering of ministry, and that's where all of you are involved. You are the bolstering. You are the encouraging of, of both of these, all of these men of God, because I'm sure that they've all crossed these, uh, these paths and walked these aisles a long time before. Everyone that's down here that has any active part of ministry, you bolster them. You encourage them. You build them up. I want to share with you a heartbreaking story that was told to me by one of my friends in Clarkson. He's, he's 89. Is he 89 years old? No, he's not that old. He's, I, think he's, I think he said he's 82. Okay. He's 82, and he's been a member of numerous different churches, and he shared with me this story when he was a deacon at a church in uh, central Kentucky. And he got into an argument or discussion with another deacon about something that the pastor was doing. And he asked that man, he said, let's just call him Bill, that's my dad's name. Bill, he said, how many pastors have there been at this church? And Bill said, ten. And my friend Roy, he said, how many of them have you loved? None of them. And, and Roy said, the problem has not been the pastor. None of the pastors have been the problem. The problem is here. Right. It's in your heart. And I want to just I want to remind you as the church, uh, <laughs> I get the feeling you may be into a time of transition. There may be, may be things that you're not exactly pleased about as far as your comfort level. What are we going to do about the future? Well, here's what you can do. Every man of God that steps up into this pulpit, you encourage them. Amen. You build them up and you, you encourage those that are standing in the gap until... Until someone else comes along. And you love every single pastor that comes to this church. And if you do that, you'll be on your way to being a church that people are attracted to. Because your spirit will open the doors and, and remind others, hey, that place over there, they're blowing and going. There's, there's something about being in that place that encourages me. And I want to invite my friends. I want to come back. That's the bolstering of ministry. And you're here tonight to participate in a tradition that God has instituted. The calling out of His workers to ministry. God called Abraham and Moses and Peter and Paul to particular ministries. In the same way He's called us to particular ministries. Me in Kentucky and Ben in Tennessee and Seth has joined us in Kentucky. He's still orange though. We're working on that. In this service we set Him aside for special called service to the Lord. And if you get the chance to tonight, you hug his neck and you tell him you're praying for him. Amen. In a moment, the ordained men are going to come and they're going to pray over you, Seth. And, and Heather and I, so you stand with him so that you hear those prayers as well. The best part of this whole ordination service is those of us who have been ordained get the chance to pray for you and lift you up to the Lord because we know how hard this path can be. <clears throat> Paul's charge to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 gives the minister some imperatives. We've talked about them, and there, there's really nine in all in all. In all. I'm not going to go over them again, but I want to just tell you this from Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 11 says, It was He, God, who gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. I can't be all of those things. I'm not called to be all of them. I've taken the spiritual gifts assessments. I know where my gifts are. Uh, teaching, administration, and, and I try to play to my strengths. You need to take those assessments. You need to figure out what your strengths are and then play to them and then build a team around yourself that can play to your weaknesses. Those, those areas where you need to, to be challenged. And here's why he did that. He gave gifts to all of us. Amen. To prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. We want to become mature, right? Amen. Our prayers for that baby over there are that she mature, that she grow into a young woman of God. We don't want her when she's 20 to still be sitting in a high chair. Right, Heather? <laughs> we don't want her to be eating baby food. We want her to be caring for herself. We want her to be living a life that glorifies God. Just as all of us have hoped to mature. So let me ask you a question. Why do we look at a kitten and expect that it's going to grow? Or a puppy and expect that it's going to grow? And a child and expect that it's going to grow? And we look at a new Christian. What's our expectation on them? They should grow. They should mature. 
We could go on. That's probably a different sermon for a different day. But are you maturing in Christ? Do you know God's Word? Do you know how to lead someone to Christ? If you don't, there's work to be done. There's maturity that needs to happen. Seth Armour's been called to this biblical ministry, and because I've been called to give the charge, Seth, you don't know this is going to happen, but I want to read some statements here, and I want to ask you to agree in the affirmative. Say, I have, or I will, or I do, however you want to, do, however you want to respond. But I'm going to ask you to stand up in front of all these witnesses, and I'm going to read these statements, and I want to ask you to agree to them as your response to this charge. Being a pastor, whether youth or congregational, is one of the hardest jobs that I've ever loved. Have you considered seriously this biblical ministry to which you are called? I have. James 3.1 teaches us that those who presume to be teachers in God's church are held to a higher standard. As a minister, you are called to this higher level of responsibility and integrity, even, even more so than other Christians. Have you seriously considered the high level of integrity, morality, and Christian living to which you are called? And will you continue to live out that high level of integrity, morality, and holy living when others around you do not? Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, your personal Lord and Savior? It is Jesus who will hold you to these promises. He's the model who went before us in loving the spiritually broken, needy, and lost. He's the one you look to whenever you have that kid sitting across from you that you just cannot agree with, but you know that their heart is broken and they're lost. He's your model. You do not enter this ministry alone, but with the help and support of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and a great cloud of witnesses who sit behind you and are already in heaven looking down over the parapets of heaven. And they're saying, that's my boy right there. I'm proud of him. Your grandfather's doing that. He loves you. He loved you and he guided you and he is one of your role models in ministry. Will you strive to encourage the church and lead the lost to a saving relationship with Christ? Will you remain faithful to the teaching of Scripture, teaching the whole counsel of God, not just the parts that are your favorite, as you teach in the church? Will you follow the leading and authority of the local pastor, that would be me, and lay leadership of the church that you serve, promoting unity for the cause of Christ? You got it, I will. All right. You can have a seat. Thank you. I don't see any reason why we can't proceed with my favorite part in the ordination of Seth Armour, and that's the laying on of hands, because he's been charged, he's been questioned, and he has come, he has risen to the service, the Lord has called him. And I don't think that we can stand in the way of that. So Ben, you come and uh, let's continue with the prayer. Today. Seth, why don't you come up here? The Bible says in Acts 13, verses 1 through 3, all right, this is the, this is the setting. That there, now they were in the church that was in Antioch, certain prophets and teachers. Uh, and it goes down through the list of all those men. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul. For the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and then sent them away. Now, the, the final step of this ordination service is to, to lay our hands on Seth. And the reason we do that is so that we can empower him with, with the Holy Spirit of God as he moves forward from here into the next service to whatever God calls him to do. Currently, he's in Kentucky. But as this ordination service concludes tonight, it does so with the laying on hands of ordained men, of other called men of God, to confirm not only this, this man of God, but to empower him with the Holy Spirit um, with those hands. So, Seth, I'm going to ask you for just a moment, if you will just take a knee. And in front of this congregation, I want to ask that you would all... Bow your heads for just a moment. And as the, 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 the men who are ordained, if they would stand and come forward. And I would ask each, each individual, each ordained man, to come and lay hands on Seth. Pray for him individually. As the rest of you pray for yourself. For the time you go ahead.
So tonight we have witnessed um, uh, a service that is as old as the New Testament itself. It's a it's a wonderful it's a wonderful ceremony that we can enjoy that they did in the in the in the, in the New Testament uh, and that, that that prophets did anointing kings in the Old Testament. It's the same God. It's the same Word. It's the same Spirit. And so tonight, it is my great pleasure as the pastor of Second Baptist Church, and on behalf of this committee, to present to you uh, Seth brother, Seth Arman. <laughs> We're going to have a short uh, service uh, afterwards, a fellowship, I guess, meal, and uh, we're going to do that in the fellowship hall, so if you're visiting with us, um, we, uh, we would like for you to, uh, to be part of that. Um, if you go out, the easiest way to get there is just follow us at that door. Just follow the person in front of you, you'll be fine. Um, we'll find it. One, one last thing is we do have, um, the committee did uh, present, would like to present Seth a, a Bible, an ordination Bible. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's a gift, if you will, from us to you, uh, to use on behalf of your ministry to the Lord, and, and may, you, uh, may, you, may you always cherish that Bible as, as a reminder of the service that we had here today. Okay? Uh, let's give Seth and Heather one last chance. Thank you, guys. Uh, it's good to be home. No. <laughs> so, uh, we're just going to keep doing what we're doing, and uh, we'll check in from time to time. Y'all keep praying for us. So. Amen. We love what we do, and we are trade for nothing. Amen. All right. Y'all go ahead and stand together. We'll pray, and then we'll be dismissed, okay? Before you leave, I would ask that you just come by and give him a hug. Um, uh, shake his hand, however you want to do it, and just tell him that you love him, okay? Uh, part of that bolstering process as we send him forth to do the Lord's work. So if you bow your heads with me, please, I'll pray. Father, tonight, once again, we thank you and we love you for all that you've done tonight in this service. Father, it's, special, it's a special thing to watch you work uh, in the life of your called men and women. Uh, Lord, I thank you for this, uh, this occasion that we've all gotten to share together. Lord, I feel like our hearts have been knitted together, that our Christian love for one another has been, has been bolstered through this, uh, through this service tonight. But, Father, most of all, as Seth and Heather go forward to do the service that you have laid before them, <laughs> Father, may your word be a lamp unto their feet, a light unto their path, and, Lord, that they hide your word in their hearts so that not only do they not sin against you, Father, but they can see clearly the path that you have laid out in front of them. Father, for everyone else that's been here tonight, I pray a special blessing as we go forth. Uh, Father, and as we partake in this meal uh, that we're about to eat, Father, we ask that your blessing be upon it as well. And we ask all of this in Jesus' precious and holy name. And amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. Congratulations. Congratulations. Hey, stinker food. Hey, stinker food. Hey, stinker food.